So it's Thursday, and uh, I'm recording. So my plan is I'm going to play some of the videos I've been recording throughout the week at this conference, um, and then I'll come back and I'll, I'll, I'll wrap things up. So uh, just as a, a framing, one of the things I wanted to really focus on was to you know, talk about the big exciting news, of course, at the conference, but also to, to I went around, you know, all week I've been asking people what they think about this, about what the true success stories are of machine learning in the past few years. Um, and, you know, I got people's opinions and I'll, I'll, I'll share them with you at the end of the, you know, once I show you the other clips. I'm walking back to my hotel room after my first day at the conference. Uh, today I spent most of my day at the uh, Women in Machine Learning uh, workshop. Um, there I saw a lot of interesting talks, um, but then the main conference started and John Platt, who used to be a researcher at Microsoft, I believe, uh, is now leading the Google Applied Science team, um, talked about how he's using machine learning to tackle issues about uh, energy and, and long-term problems with energy. So he was talking about how we, he can use machine learning to address issues in uh, science on how to develop nuclear fusion. So that seems like a really huge impact thing. It's one of these things that I'm really trying to find is what are the big impact applications of machine learning that people are excited about at NIPS. And uh, he was basically using machine learning to um, to help scientists who are working on nuclear fusion to run experiments, right? They wanted to, they want to try out different experimental settings in a, in a big simulator. Um, oh, maybe it's not a simulator. Maybe it's a real machine. I, I, I sort of spaced out in the middle of the talk because, you know, he went on for about 40 minutes about nuclear fusion, and it's a bit outside my expertise area. Um, but the point was that uh, he was able to you know, make some gains and he's predicting that with machine learning, with the help of his work at, at the Google Applied Science Division, um, that he'll be able to uh, help the scientists that he's working with uh, develop nuclear fusion in the next couple years, right? which is huge. Right? That's much bigger than a lot of the things we usually work on with machine learning. Um, and he, you know, he he started out the whole talk with his whole motivation that, like, this is the one of the biggest impact projects that you could possibly work on uh, in any of si in all of science, right? Because because you look at what humanity needs, and all almost all of our problems could be solved if we had energy at the scale that nuclear fusion could provide. Hey, so I'm taking a break from the conference now because I can record some thoughts now about what I've seen today. Um, so pretty cool stuff this morning. Um, there was an invited talk by Brendan Frey talking about uh, his work doing, using machine learning for, for genomics. And he points out that uh, this is a, it's very, very much along the lines of the, you know, the theme I've been trying to uh, uh, communicate in my visits, to, in, my, in my discussions with everybody at the conference about you know, what the big success stories or upcoming success stories might be. And, and he points out things like uh, how um, you know, machine learning is able to look at um, you know, genomes uh, and, and do something that essentially is, is it's an example of something that computers are possibly good at, but humans are not good at this. Right? You, you look at things like computer vision and playing games, Computers are very, sorry, humans are very good at these things uh, for games because we invented games and for, um, for, for computer vision because it's, you know, it's trying to mimic the human visual uh, ideas, or the things that we do with our vision systems. So what he was talking about was that, you know, this is a chance for us to really make a big difference. And he points to examples like how they've come up with, you know, they have all these tools now to modify people's genomes, but we don't know what to do with them. Um, and so he points that to the fact that the uh, pharmaceutical industry spends years uh, over, dec over a decade approximately uh, developing some of their major drugs. And, and because they spend so much time doing this, it makes the drug really expensive for when it comes out. You know, um, and what he believes is a great opportunity for machine learning is to shorten the development cycle, to, to point to the um, scientists working on this to where they can uh, you know what experiments they should be running. Uh, you know what parts of the genome they should be trying to to interact with with the drugs. Um, 
and so on. I, I don't know much, enough about genomics to, to be able to fully summarize what he was talking about, but the basic idea is that uh, this is an opportunity for machine learning to make a big impact um, on people's lives. And he also points out that, that uh, he doesn't believe that um, medicine can continue the way it can, and, that, and we basically can't afford to not use machine learning to do this. So pretty interesting stuff. And then after that, Nips gave this uh, test of time award to an old paper, so a paper from, I think, I think 2007, by uh, Ali Rahimi and uh, uh, Ben Recht. And this is a paper about using random features and how you can train the model um, by picking random features, applying some nonlinear transform to them, and then just you know, just training weights for those random features. And he and uh, and and Ali gave what I thought was a really really good talk, where he first goes over he went he went over sort of what they you know the work that won the award, but then he took the, the chance to talk about how things have changed since uh, you know ten years ago in machine learning and machine learning research. And one of the big points he was making was that uh, there used to be there used to be a lot of rigor in machine learning, and now we're kind of in the space where because we don't understand, we don't fully understand how like deep neural networks are working, we sort of think of it magically. We think of it, he, he used an al analogy that it's like alchemy, where, um, you know, alchemy is important in the history of science because it was one of the early sciences um, that led to a bunch of other forms of science, but, but this particular but, but it also had a lot of you know magical thinking in it. So where you say, oh, well, I tried this one thing, I sprinkled some you know technique onto it, uh, and then uh, it worked. So maybe that maybe from that you you extrapolate to some theory about how that may generalize to all these other problems you want to solve, and, and it's not real. So uh, he actually pointed to batch normalization, which we talked about last week, um, as a, a prime example of this, where he said that batch normalization, if you look at the literature, a lot of people say it works because of this thing called the internal covariance shifts or something. And he, and he <laughs> asked for a show of hands of like, who, you know, who, who actually knows what that is? And, or I don't know, he's made some jokes, a joke about that. Um, I encourage you to watch the video, but it was really cool, a really cool talk. Um, and then there was another invited talk by Kate Crawford from Microsoft Research and uh, the leader of AI Now, where uh, she talked about fairness and bias in machine learning, specifically the issues of bias. And she points to um, a lot of issues that, that, are, that come up with, with bias, um, some of which are, you know, we've discussed in class. Um, but one thing that she pointed out that I thought was really novel uh, or something I hadn't, I hadn't really thought much about um, was she mentioned that the principle of classification is p potentially very problematic. So if you think about um, the fact that you know we assume people or any or any object can be classified into categories, the categories that we decide on very much reflect our times. Right? She, she went through a bunch of historical uh, references where they where she showed. You know how you know categorization really began with Aristotle, and, and and Aristotle came up with some way to characterize the you know objects in the world and animals, and um, you know it was based on this, the understanding of things at the time. And she points to another example, a more modern example of of how there was some kind of uh, I think a psychological text that that was uh, you know one of the earlier texts that that characterized you know homosexuality as a psychological disorder and and uh, this you know text was not it was not intending to be you know discriminatory or anything but it you know it was, it was supposedly used for actual science and because of that it, it was partially encoded into or it was encoded into the Dewey decimal system and that was only very recently updated so a few years ago, you could have gone to if you if you went to a library and tried to look up something with the Dewey Decimal System, you would have to look for homosexuality in this, the category as a, as a subcategory of, uh, of of psychological disorders. So, you know, if we train models, or we, or if we create data sets based on other data sets or based on other other texts or and so on or other data, we're going to carry whatever biases care, are in those data sets on to the next data set and, and, and she went through this big hierarchy of how you know, the ImageNet data set was based on the image, the WordNet data set uh, which was based on something else. We have to be very careful about 
you know, what conclusions we make about when we say machine learning models can, care, can classify according to these classifications. So anyway, uh, I, you should probably watch the video of her talk. Uh, it was, she'll, she did it a lot better than, she explained it a lot better than I can right now as I'm walking, walking through this uh, weird uh, part. Uh, I hope some of that made sense. I encourage you to watch the talks. They're all, they're all online. If you go to the NIPS uh, Facebook page, you can watch the talks that they've been you know, live streaming and then people have recorded them and they're, they're also showing up on YouTube now. Um, but as I said, you know, one of the big things that I wanted to you know, discuss with you know, the big experts in machine learning is uh, what they thought about what the true success stories are in machine learning. And I'll, I'll start by saying that you know, this is all biased because I, the people I talk to, the people I um, you know, feel comfortable going up to and asking this question to uh, are, are you know, approximately the type of people who do the research that I do. What we were discussing is, you know, what the true success stories are. And in a lot of the conversations I had, the real success stories that have come up, you know, especially in the context of things that where deep learning has helped a lot are, are speech recognition and, and, and uh, translation. And these are things that, you, you know, you look at what we're able to do now and they far surpass what people expected um, years ago. And, they far they surpassed the progress that we had seen, um, you know, for the years preceding the recent excitement, um, and it's, it's it's at the point where you can pretty accurately so this if you look at like the the tools that we have now like uh, Siri and Google Home and uh, Amazon Alexa, they're they tend to be good at understanding what at, at knowing what you ask them. They're not that good at answering the questions that you asked of them, but they're really good at understanding what you say. Um, even if you're across the room, you know, that kind of stuff is, is quite revolutionary. So, so that's a real success story. And then another common theme that I thought, I think most people agreed on this, is that uh, the excitement about computer vision is a little bit ahead of where we are in the sense that, you know, we're able to solve things that um, are mostly like tech demos, right? You know, you, I wouldn't have said that six years ago because if, I, some, if somebody told me that we can at classify 1,000 categories better than a human, um, I would be really excited. I would think that that's, that's, we're making real progress. But then when you put that in context, what are we able to do with those classifications? Or what are we able to do that actually helps humans? And, and we're not able to do that much yet. I mean, right, there's, there's stuff in the future that will happen. Um, but I don't think we, we can't really give, you know, an ImageNet classifier or even, even the Google, Google Photos classifier, which is, I think, one of the best ones out there. And we're not sure what, what machinery actually goes into that. Um, if we give that to somebody who is not able to actually see, um, whether because they're visually impaired or because they're not physically there, if, you're, you know, if it's a robot remotely describing a scene, um, it's not really ready to do that. Right? You can't do that, and then, you know, you would basically get, you get a lot of inaccuracies, and then you got get a lot of things that are outside the one thousand categories that are really important to understand. And we we can't, you know, you, you can't make decisions unless you have something more precise than those one thousand categories. And then there, and then so there's work on you know higher, uh, you know, more classification or sorry more classes, but it's just not as good as we would like it to be. Um, there's other things that people talk about. So a, a, a few researchers mentioned, you know, medical uh, applications, especially medical imaging. And this is again another case where I think, I think maybe in the near future that could be a real success story. Right, right now it's not there. Right now you don't really have doctors trusting artificial intelligence tools. Um, but for sure, I could imagine in a few years, or maybe even in one year or so, you could have tools that that could help doctors with their real workflows. And one, one of the things that um, a, a researcher from Microsoft pointed out to me is that there's a lot of tedious tasks that doctors have to perform, like, uh, like labeling images, or not just labeling images, but identifying parts of images that represent you know, abnormal tissue or something like that, where it's really you know, tedious and, and um, uh, grueling work, right? And imagine you have, I don't know how many, but hundreds of these images to annotate it could be really expensive and really costly. 
um, from a time perspective. So it would cost a lot of time, but, and um, you know, when these doctors could be seeing patients instead. So, so having a computer help you with that, even if it's not perfect, if it's just to, to you know, give you an initial annotation that you then clean up, would save a lot of time and be a real, that, that would be a real Im, you know, impact that, that is a true success story. Um, so uh, let me think, other th people mentioned to me a couple applications. One was chatbots, and uh, I thought that I would have a chance to see the chatbot demo, but I think that's happening later, so maybe I'll report back on Tuesday um, to let you know if there really is progress in chatbots. But the, the chatbots I've used are, are pretty uh, uh, proof of concept at this point, right? They're, they're not, they're not, they're not going to pass any, any reasonable notion of the Turing test, um, nor are, th are they really, I mean, what we really want from a chatbot is that it doesn't have to pass a Turing test, but it has to be like, useful and not annoying in, in, how, in the errors that it makes. Um, and I haven't even seen it, anything get passed past that, so maybe I'm wrong. So I, I'll, I'll let you know on Tuesday. Uh, I'll, I'll definitely try to check it out, what they, sh what they have to showcase at, this, uh, at the conference. It seems like there's a lot of really powerful things that have happened um, that work for entertainment purposes, right? So game playing, I would, I would argue, is somewhat for entertainment purposes. And, um, and a lot of the, the demos, like Google Photos, is kind of entertainment. Um, but once you put it into like a critical application, a lot of these things are not ready um, for, to, to really call a true, true success story. Again, except for things like speech recognition, um, I know. I, I guess I I would still hesitate to put that into a critical application, but you know, it's only a little bit. I, I mean, it, it would certainly be like you get that and a human transcriber um, to work together. That would be absolutely a great way to use the current technology. So um, anyway, that's th those are some of my thoughts. I'll have more next week when I get back from the conference. Um, but overall, the general theme whenever I have this discussion with people is like kind of a eye-opening discussion where people, you know, you look at all the excitement, you look at all the corporate sponsors at NIPS. I didn't get a show, maybe you can see online people have photos of the, the exhi exhibition hall. It's just like t tons of companies and huge displays and uh, IBM brought their quantum computer to, for no reason. It wasn't really relevant to machine learning. Um, and it's... Uh, you compare that to what we're actually able to do right now, and it's quite different, right? What we're actually able to do right now, we can count on one injured hand, um, on, and on, uh, and what we're, and what we're claiming we're able to do, and what people are like worried about because we're so good at, you know, because AI is so strong and so powerful, is so far away, um, and it's very, it's uh, you know, I've been repeating this theme all semester. It's a very different feeling because when I was trained as a grad student we were trying to convince the world that machine learning is ready you know please <laughs> read our papers and uh, now people are now we want like people to read our papers more carefully and be careful to, to, to not jump to conclusions about what we're able to do okay anyway so uh, I hope this is, has been informative for you and maybe um, we can talk about it on Tuesday all right see you